Hi, I'm Steve Rosted. I'm an open source engineer at VMware. And with that, I also want to say that since I made this presentation on VMware time, I want to give a shout out to VMware for allowing me, not only just allowing me, but encouraging me to give presentations like this. So today I'm going to be talking about new ways to find latency in Linux using tracing. And we're going to be specifically focusing on ftrace. Well, what is ftrace? Ftrace is the official tracer of the Linux kernel. It was introduced in 2008, but before that, it was kind of had two parents. Um, I had a tracer that I used way back for my master's thesis in 1998. And then there's this tracer that was part of the preempt RT patch back in 2004. Well, the preempt RT patch was added, was specific to make Linux into a hard real time system. And to do that, you had to make the kernel as transparent as possible to be able to see where latencies are being caused. So there was a lot of infrastructure in that early patch that allowed you to investigate where latencies happened. And it was put together, it was had various things for specific for wake up latencies, IRQs latencies. And back around 2007, people were, liked a lot of the infrastructure that the preempt RT patch had and asked to see if we could get that into mainline. Well, the problem with the infrastructure that the preempt RT patch had for tracing was that it was never made for production use. It was just to debug the current situation. So to make it mainline, we had to make it, a little, had to clean it up and rewrite it. One of the issues with the old version of the tracing is if you wanted a wake up latency tracer, you would compile it into your kernel, boot the kernel, the tracer was enabled. When you're done, you want to disable it, you compile it out of the kernel, reboot your kernel and had the wake up latency tracer no longer running. This was not something that would be we would encourage to have because we would like to have these tracers in production use and we don't want people rebooting their kernels. So I took on the endeavor to rewrite everything from scratch basically and come up with was now known as the ftrace infrastructure that allows you to turn on and off different tracers at runtime without recompiling, without rebooting your kernel. And not only that, to be on production use, a lot of effort was made to make sure that when these tracers and these plugins were disabled, they would not have an overhead for the system. Otherwise, if it had an overhead, people wouldn't compile it and wouldn't be on production systems. But a lot has happened since 2008. And I've given a lot of talks on how to use ftrace and the tracing, but I haven't spent much time on the new features that we have. And there's a specific feature I do wanna talk about. But let's look at the ftrace interface. To interact with ftrace, there is a tracefs file system. Now, if it's compiled in the kernel, which most distributions have it compiled by default, you will see in the sysfs directory so under slash sys kernel tracing, you'll see the first of all, the directory exists. It just suddenly appears on their sysfs, sysfs directory. Uh, if file system will be a tracing directory there. And if it does, something like systemd will usually mount it. And you'll see the command. If it's not mounted already, the command is on the uh, screen right there. You can use the mount T of tracefs and mount the tracing file system. And if you look at it, there's all these files. Now, these files are, you can interact with it with simple echo and cat because the operations to enable and disable ftrace is basically all done in ASCII. And to read the trace files, you just cat a file and it gives you information in ASCII. So most of the work is ASCII. And if you have a busy box system, you basically have full functional ftrace. But that could be overwhelming. I've given talks on how to use this before and that's not what I wanna talk about today. Today, I'm gonna to use the utility called tracecmd or trace command. It's a utility I wrote that interacts with the tracefs directory so you don't have to. And it makes it a little bit more intuitive to use. There's man pages, um, bash completion helpers. So when using trace command, you could actually have a little bit more understanding of what is being traced and how to enable and implement everything. Well, let's look at the old tracers from back in 2008 timeframe. And as I said, ftrace came from the real-time patch. So there was a lot of emphasis on latency tracing within ftrace. And back then, we call them plugins when you switch from one tracer to the next. Uh, but today we call them tracers. And we have the wake up latency tracer, which basically traces the time from when a task wakes up to when it actually runs. 
there's three kinds. There's all tasks, RT tasks, and deadline tasks. Well, why is there three different types of uh, tracing? All tasks will trace the latency of real time and deadline as well. But the reason why we separate it is because they have different requirements on how long they need to be scheduled. So if you're tracing all tasks, and the way these uh, tracing wake up latency tracer works is that it records the max latency. So when, as the preempt RT patch cared for worst case uh, latencies, we would only record the worst case scenario. So if another worst case latency, a bigger latency happened, it would throw away the old latency and you get the new one. Now, if you're tracing all tasks, and because all tasks, the normal non real time tasks, don't have the requirements of running immediately like a real time task does, it almost guarantees that their latency is going to always be bigger than a real time task. And if you care about the real time tasks only, that means if you only use the all tasks wake up latency, you'll always get a non real time task as its latency, and it makes the tracer useless. So when you enable the real time task, Latency tracer only looks at real time tasks. That way, you can monitor the worst case scenario or worst case latency for the real time tasks on your system. Same thing goes for the deadline tracers. The other type of latency tracing we have uh, for tracers is the preemption tracers, preemption off. What this means is when a task is running inside the kernel, there could be a situation where it goes into a critical section and it can't be preempted, it can't be scheduled out. It must finish, run to completion before it gives up the CPU and allows another process to take over the CPU. That's what we call preemption disable. There's two ways basically to disable preemption within the kernel. One is disabling interrupts because it usually takes an interrupt to initiate a preemption. So an interrupt comes from a device or a timer or whatever that says, okay, enough, this, whatever task is running needs to stop and schedule another process. So when interrupts are disabled, you take away all the types chance of being preempted. With, but there's other locations where you don't disable interrupts, but you still need to finish the critical section, in which case it will disable preemption and won't let you preempt it otherwise. But interrupts could still come in. So if you have a device driver that requires to be immediate serviced in a timely fashion, preempt disable won't stop that from being serviced because the interrupt will go off. So let's look at wake up latency. So the way the wake up latency tracers work is that it there's an event when the process, a task is woken up and when the task is scheduled in. And here you'll see there's task one that's going along, an interrupt comes in that now will wake up task two. So we wanna measure what's that length of time. So we actually measure from the time the wake up actually occurred to the time it actually schedules it in. That's the latency. Obviously the latency is really a little bit longer than that because it's when the interrupt actually triggered is probably most likely when the interrupt was supposed to go up. But what, that's, this is usually good enough. And to run it, here's how we run the wake up our real-time tracer. So here we do trace command start. Start means enable it on the Linux kernel tracing. So when you do trace command start, it enables the tracing on the kernel that you're running. Dash P, like I said, we used to call it plugins. Now we call it tracers. But since trace command was written back when we called it plugins, I used dash P. Dash T is used for something else, so we can't use it anymore. So when you see dash P, it really means tracer. Not uh, It used to be called plugin, but we don't use that terminology. That means something else now. But dash P, wake up RT, is the real time uh, wake up tracer for real time tasks. Then I do trace command show to see the output of that. And here you see the latency was 94 microseconds. And over to the top right, you'll see that there's an RT 47 there, meaning that this is a real time kernel that I'm running. And even in, below that, you'll see a prempt RT there. Uh, it shows that the real time task was a, a RCU a helper kernel thread uh, with a real time priority of one. Now remember the priorities inside the kernel are inverse to what you see in uh, user space. The lower the priority number, the higher the priority. So a real time prior priority of one is extremely high. That's basically a 98 priority in user space. Uh, then it shows you where the task was scheduled in and it gives you a stack trace of there. So I continue on to finish up the stack trace. Then it shows you all the functions that were called between the time the task was woken up to the time the task uh, was scheduled in. And finally, it shows you where it got scheduled in and a stack trace of the kernel of what happened there. So if something was long, you want to investigate this more, you have a lot of information at your hands to go and look at that. What about interrupt off uh, tracer? So remember, I said you could disable interrupts and then enable interrupts and also preemption as well. But here, I'm just going to look at interrupts off. So when a task disables interrupts and an interrupt comes in, it has to wait until the interrupts are enabled again before it could trigger. And we like to trace 
the time. So we have ways of whenever interrupts are disabled, we have a way of tracing that. And when it's enabled, we check to see if it's greater than the max latency. So we measure all the, the greatest times in the kernel that interrupts are disabled or preemption is disabled or both. So here I'm interested in both preemption being disabled and interrupts being disabled because I want to see what's the longest that and this task could have that I can't have a real-time task schedule in because when preemption is disabled, no matter how high a priority process come, wakes up, it must wait until preemption is enabled again before it could continue. And here you'll see the latency is uh, over two milliseconds long. Well, if you look over the top right, this is not a real-time kernel. I ran this on the 514 RC4 kernel with some patches I had applied ready to be pushed up to Linus. And that but it gives you an idea of how much trace it could show you. And again, it shows you from when the uh, preemption or the interrupts were disabled. And you'll see that it happened at a raw spin lock. And that shows you all the functions that ran until the end, I cut off a lot of these functions. And then at the very end, it gives you a stack trace showing you where that uh, latency occurred. So you can actually debug it right down, see in the code how, why this latency happened that was so long. Say I don't want to add function tracing in between the points. I just want to know what the longest time is when interrupts or preemption is disabled, I put in the dash D on the trace command start option, and that tells trace command to not enable function tracing. Basically, it means disable function tracing while you're doing the tracing. The dash capital O sim offset that I have here adds a little more information to the stack trace. So when I do look at the stack trace, it gives me a index from the function that started plus the actual where the function called. This way, I can actually go into GDB, look at a debug version of the uh, <clears throat> Linux code and then be able to see the exact lines of where these function calls were done. Well, what about the latency of how long an interrupt is running for? Because let's say you have a task that you don't care about interrupts, but you have a high priority task and you want to see how much the kernel is bothering that task. So when an interrupt occurs, that task stops what it's doing. Interrupts go, the interrupt handler happens, could be process help doing something for a lower priority task and then comes back. Well, that's a latency that we may care about. Well, we don't have a specific latency tracer for this, but you can use function graph tracing. So for x86 kernel here, I'm going to do something a little bit different with trace command. Instead of doing start, which starts tracing within the kernel, I'm going to do record. What record does is instead of just letting the trace happen within the internal uh, kernel ring buffer, it will actually extract at a very fast rate the information from the ring buffer into a file. So when this is done, it'll actually, actually you could look at a file and it could be much larger than the actual internal ring buffer is if the reader could keep up from it. So I do a trace command record with the dash P for tracer for the function graph. The dash L means limit what is going to be traced. Here, I'm only looking at the handle IRQ event because I know that for the x86 kernel that the function called handle IRQ event is one of the uh, functions that does interrupts that I'm going to trace. And the function graph tracer will trace both the beginning and end and give me a time difference of how long that function ran for. I also know that all the vectors inside the x86 have a function that has sysvec, as you can see here. So the star sysvec underscore star says, trace all the functions that have that in its name. Then I'm going to enable the um, events for tracing the IRQ handler entry event and also the IRQ vectors of every IRQ vector entry name to give me the names of these interrupts. And from here, if I do a trace command report, because report, remember last time we had show, which showed the internal ring buffer, report will actually read the trace.dat file and give me that the information. And since I also know that I only care about CPU2, if I just remove that CPU2 from the options, you'll see a lot of interleaved uh, traces and I it makes it hard to explain or, or understand the flow of events if you see this inter with CPU2, CPU3, CPU4 intermingled here. So I only care about CPU2. And here you can see the first one was the timer interrupt that took 12 microseconds. And there was an IRQ work service interrupt, that's this vec, the vector interrupt, that took um, 1.4 microseconds. And it goes down and then the handle IRQ event, because I enabled the IRQ handler entry event, the handle IRQ event function took 13 microseconds. Uh, but I also got to see it was the A AHCI interrupt handler. So what's the problems with the old time latency tracers? One is 
it really has not much control over what it's going to trace. You could say, okay, all tasks, real-time tasks, deadline tasks, but what if you only care about one real-time task and you don't care about all the other real-time tasks? So it only traces the highest priority processes of that group. And it may not be the process that you're interested in. Not very flexible. It has one use case and it's generic for basically the whole system. What about the function graph tracer that I just showed you here? It's a little more flexible. You do a lot more of it, but it's a recording of a stream of events. It doesn't give you that, what's the worst case scenario? You could just say, okay, trace for a long time. And then you actually have to write some utility to search through that to find the worst case scenario there. And if the events were to be dropped somehow, if for some reason the reader can't keep up with the writer, then you may have lost that worst case scenario. So I wanna introduce something called synthetic events. Well, what are synthetic events? Event, synthetic events can map two events into a single event. That is, you could take the sked waking event and the sked switch event, map them together and create a new event, let's say called wake up latency. And that wake up latency event will have, can have information from both those two events, including the timestamps. The IQ disable and enable to create a IQ's off latency tracing event, which I want to point out, by the way, when I said in the beginning that when everything, these tracers, when they're disabled, they have very, very little overhead. Unfortunately, the IRQs off, the IRQ tracing, the PRAMP tracing, I would recommend to keep those disabled or not configured in on a production system because the way preemption disabled and interrupts disabled inside the kernel is implemented, it's extremely efficient. So putting any infrastructure around to do any tracing, even though it might be a few no ops placed in there, will cause a noticeable like one to 2% overhead on the system, even when the tracing is disabled. So for the IRQs and preempt off tracing, I usually tell people to do that for debug environments, but don't run that in uh, production, unfortunately. We may fix that in the future, but we'll see. Uh, back to the IRQ entry and handler. By the way, it's only that interrupts off, everything else is fine with it's off. But the IRQ entry handler and the IRQ uh, exit handlers um, could be put together to say IRQ latency uh, synthetic event. These all behave like normal events. That is, when you create a synthetic event, they have things like they can be filtered on. You could put filters on the events, just like you do any other events, and you could attach triggers to them. And one of the triggers is creating histograms. So how do you create a synthetic event? Well, it's easy. You just echo this, like the event name with the fields into the synthetic events field paper, and then you type this his trigger colon, following the PID, the arguments, timestamps into a, the beginning uh, event and then the end event. You want to put in all these commands. Very simple, very you know, intuitive, easy to do. No, too complex. So synthetic events have been around the kernel for several years now, but no one uses them. I know this because as soon as I started using them heavily, I found a bunch of bugs that if anyone else was using them, they would have discovered too. But the thing here I noticed is that because the interface is so complex, we don't have users, even though it's extremely useful to have this information, but people just didn't take up the time to figure out how to use it. So how do we solve that? Well, introducing libtracefs. Libtracefs is a library that can be compiled to any C program that allows you to interact with the TraceFS file system. Trace command actually uses this to interact with uh, the file system as well. And one thing that we just created was a new interface called TraceFS SQL. Yes, SQL, what you do databases with. And by the way, you download it. And the TraceFS SQL man page has an example of how to use it to create synthetic events. And that man page is, since most of the work is done in the TraceFS SQL function, the man page that uses it is actually a fully operable um, function that one, you could do make SQL list and it'll extract the, man, the code from the man page and compile it and create the utility. And that utility has its own man page. So a man page actually has a man page for a man page. So this is what it looks like uh, for that command. Here, things you might actually understand, you know, basic SQL statements, select from, join, on, where, things that people recognize. Uh, you could define what the synthetic event name would be that's created here. I'm focusing on wake up latency right now. So here I have the start event. So think of, since it's SQL, think of events as tables. The fields within the event are columns and every instance of an event is a row. Now, how do we merge these two? So think about 
for an SQL point of view, we do the from and join two tables. So the start event, which is a sked waking event, we join it to the sked switch event. And what's nice here is the as uh, command in SQL allows you to basically define the name of that sked waking. For a beginning, I said sked waking as start, and you can see there's it's used throughout the rest of the um, the command. I don't have to type sked waking all around. I only just type it once at the from and label what's going to be. I could use that even before it was defined. And same thing for the end. The end is there and I have all the end there. Then I have to have a way to map these two events. The sked waking event has a PID field that is the, the PID process ID of the task that's being woken up. The sked switch event has both a previous process ID of the task that's being scheduled out of the CPU. And then the next PID is the schedule, task that's being scheduled in. So I wanna map the time from when the PID is woken up to when it's scheduled in. So the next PID, so here I say on start.pid equals and next PID. What's nice here is also there's a special field that we have is like timestamp. Now timestamp is in nanoseconds, but if you think that's too, has, too much precision, you want to lessen that. So we could use microseconds, because people usually measure in microseconds. Nanoseconds, one you know, is probably uh, too much. So we have timestamp USEC, um, which will give you the start end, the timestamp of the end event, which was the sked switch, minus the beginning uh, event, which was the sked wake up, and that gives us the actual time that it took for that task to wake up from the time it woke up was woken up to what it's scheduled in and we record that into a field called delta. Then we could say, we only care about the cyclic test program. I'll talk a little bit about the cyclic test program, but I'm going to filter this only so that this, well, this event tracing and all this will happen only on the, a program called cyclic test. Uh, and I just realized I have a typo here. This was cut and paste here. It shouldn't be next PID, it should actually be next com. So I just noticed I have a mistake in my slides. That's okay. That's what happens when I get do cut and paste errors. Anyway, cyclic test, real quick. Here's where you can see cyclic test. It's used by the real-time uh, Linux community to basically measure wake-up latency. It does a lot of uh, stress, a bunch of CPUs doing a bunch of wake-ups and knows exactly when it's supposed to wake up and then when it actually did schedule in and it gives you the jitter of telling you how much it was off. But let's go and look at running this command. So I'm going to do the SQL hist command. And dash E means not just show me the commands that it's going to produce to create the synthetic events, but actually execute them. Then the dash N, as I said before, creates the synthetic event called wake up lap. Dash T does two things. Well, by default, it will not only create the synthetic event, but it will also trace it. So when this condition matches, you know, the, the next com uh, matches cyclic tests and all that, it will actually um, trigger a trace of the synthetic event. But you can also put dash small s, which will do a snapshot of the event. So when it happens, it takes a snapshot with a ring buffer and you go look at that instead. Here, I want to do both. I want to trace and snapshot, which requires a dash capital T. Dash M is, I care about only do the snapshot and trace when it hits a new max. So every time there's a new max, it's going to do a snapshot and it's going to do a trace um, on the lat uh, field, which I already defined as the delta here. And here I trace cyclic tests, this time with the correct uh, command next com, because this one I actually took cut and paste of something I actually ran. Now, after I did this, it's running, it's filtering, there's a synthetic, synthetic event looking for a cyclic test program to, to trace its wake-up latency on. So I enable first all events, because I'm interested in all events that are happening in this wake-up, not just this synthetic event. But for the synthetic event, I have to call it out and say dash capital R stack trace, which means dash capital R is a trigger. And the trigger I want to do is when this happens on this event, do a stack trace. I don't want all events doing a stack trace. I only want this event. That's why I have to call it out separately. I run the cyclic test command and that's the command you're going to see. Um, I'm not going to go through the, um, all the options there. It's, you can look at the man page. And then I do a dash, uh, a trace command show again. Now, so this is running, it shows the actual ring buffer, but the dash S here says, show me the snapshot buffer. I don't care about the running buffer that's constantly going. I want to just see the snapshot of the last time this triggered and give me a snapshot. And you can see there's the wake up latency trace, uh, um, the wake up synthetic event, which next com with cyclic test and told me it shows me a lat, uh, latency of 17 microseconds. And it happened on CPU two. So let's pull this data out of the kernel and make it into a trace.dat file that we can look at 
more thoroughly. So the trace command extract dash s, trace command extract extracts the data from the ring buffer from the kernel. Dash s means do this for the snapshot. And then I do a trace command report to read the trace file that's made. CPU2, because I'm only interested in CPU2. I already saw that was CPU2 that I care about. Uh, and then here I see the beginning, this get wake up happening with the cyclic test. I see where it's scheduled in and I see everything that happened in between. Again, the latency was only 17 uh, microseconds. So there's really not much here to see, but if there was an issue, I'd have no more about this. And with that, thank you very much.